Hey, Wanda. Love you. Hey, Stacy. I missed you, too. Oh, goodness. This is going to be a crying day. I'm just warning y'all now. Hey, Carol. You know... When you ask the Lord for revelation, you shouldn't be shocked when he gives it to you. And he always gives it to you in the most amazing ways. Hey, Haley, I love you, baby. Ooh, I'm sorry. I don't like starting off like this. Hey, Terry. Hey, Pramilia. I was good about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, okay, let's get started. I missed you all the last couple of weeks. I really did. Um, I heard from Erin earlier. She had her 24-week appointment. Um, with Dr. Heidi, the babies are great. Um, they're growing steady. Yeah, I'm crying. Stop it, Haley. And uh, everything's looking perfect. So, two little babies doing good, and Erin's doing great. She had her fasting blood sugar, and it was 79. How good is that? So, God is blessing and taking care of them babies. So, I can't decide if I need to tell you right now what the Lord revealed to me or wait till I get into this. And I think I'm just going to start and then let the Lord use it where he wants to. I want to read you something from Matthew Henry to get started. And the, we are going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 22. Of course, this is David, King David, but there's so much. Amen, Carol, I will, thanks. But 2 Samuel chapter 22 is where we're going to be probably this week and next week. Hey, Letitia, I love you. And there's so much in this. But I want to read you this about uh, that Matthew Henry wrote. It's just a little excerpt of uh, what he wrote about this chapter. It said, Those that have received many mercies from God ought to give him the glory of them. Every new mercy in our hand should put a new song into our mouth, even praises to our God. Where there is a grateful heart, out of the abundance of that, the mouth will speak. David spoke not only to himself for his own pleasure, not merely to those about him for their instruction, but to the Lord for his honor, the words of this song. And he was, he was talking about this chapter. I love that, that it said David spoke not only to himself for his own pleasure, not merely to those about him for their instruction, but to the Lord for his honor, the words of this song. As I've studied this chapter, and y'all know, you already know I love the Old Testament, I do. It is, our, it is our type and shadow of Christ. It is showing us what is coming in the new covenant. It's showing us how we are as fleshly people. We are the Hebrews, we are the Israelites, and we see our own failings in their example and and the redeeming power of God over and over. And um, so I, I really love spending time in the Old Testament. But I want to start uh, 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. 
and he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. We're going to stop right there. That's a lot. This is also, uh, he writes this again in the Psalms, and I forgot to look up which Psalm it was. Is it 18? 18, 28, 38? It's got an 8 at the end of it, and I can't remember which one it is, but I will write that down for y'all later. I love... I love the story of David because David was called of God to rule God's people when he was very young. But even before that happened, before he knew about it, he already had the heart of a worshiper. Something inside of David already knew deeply the value of honoring God. And I think about, thank you, Carol. I think about David a lot as a shepherd. And y'all know we've raised sheep for many years. But I think about him being the youngest child in a family of achievers. I think about him being out in the fields with those sheep. I have to tell you, I love I love sheep. I've always loved sheep, but sheep are boring. They don't do anything fancy. The only time they're like exciting is in the spring when the lambs are leaping, and that's really great. Oh, one even thank you. And hey, those green babies, oh my word, every time I see those pictures, they're just straight from God, aren't they? But watching sheep is a boring thing. And so David spent time in the fields pondering God. He wrote songs. He sang, he thought about a lot of things, and nature was all around him. And I think if the devil has succeeded in one big thing, it's that he has removed our time where we can sit and ponder God's creation. Because when you do that, It lifts your spirit. It grows you. And that maybe that's one reason why we love to go camping so much. Because when you get out camping, you're outside. You're spending time outside. You're, you're watching birds. You're hearing crickets. You're seeing insects. You're, you're watching the leaves on the trees. You're hearing the music of God's creation and it's almost overwhelming at times because you sit and you become engulfed in the majesty that is our God when you're outside and um, so I really love thinking about David I have such a uh, for lack of a better word, a kindred spirit with David. But as I was reading through this chapter, and I read through this a lot, I love, I love Second Samuel and, and his verse 2. And he said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. And that led me into studying about my rock. Psalms 31, 2 and 3. Psalms 31, 
2 and 3. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Since you, God, Jehovah, are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. For the sake of your name, God, because I'm honoring you. I'm honoring you. Therefore, if I honor God, sorry, my nose is running. If I honor God with my life, it is to God's, I don't want to say benefit, but to God's benefit to protect me, strengthen me, help me, because I am doing what I do to honor him. Does that, does that make sense? Y'all know I don't mean it to God's benefit. It's to honor God for the sake of his name. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. I don't know if you've ever been in an area where it's just... You're right, you're right, Wanima. Wanima wrote... We have lost the connection with our Creator. Life is too busy. We all need to slow down and just sit back and listen. Yes, yes, yes. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. These scriptures our life, they are paramount to our success in this earth. If we don't equip ourselves with this understanding, we will fall because the enemy is all around us. The Bible says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour me. Because I've got the power of Almighty God within me. Because I know the promises of His Word. I know whose I am. I know who He is. I cry in grief. Because I see God's people suffering. And dare I say it, in some cases, needlessly, needlessly, because of all that he has given to provide for us. Luke six forty eight. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Now, you know, in my mind, even as a child, I used to picture this. You know, the next part is the guy builds his house on the sand and the, the wind comes and the, just the house just dissolves. When you're standing on the beach and your feet are in the sand and a wave comes up and you're trying to stand steady, but the sand just washes out from under you. Well, you know, the surface of a rock, it might be craggy or notched or, or rough, but just to sit something on a rock doesn't make it steady. 
right? You can, you can, you can be standing on bald rock up on Cheha Mountain and lose your footing and slide off. It doesn't make you steady just to be above a rock. What's the difference, ladies? What's the difference? Do you just like perch up there? No. You've got to embed your footing in that rock. You've got to you've got to secure yourself into that rock. Because otherwise you're just kind of floating with the elements. And that may be a missing link for some folks because because some folks that's sort of like it's sort of like the idea that you can just go to church and hear the preacher once every week and you're okay. And we all know that's not the case. We all know that. We see it all the time. Sadly, people just go to church and they think, okay, or they'll post, um, praise the Lord or a little scripture here and there, but, but their life is falling apart. That's, that's being perched up on top. That's not digging in. Luke chapter six, 47 through 49. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man built, which built a house and digged deep. I'm going to back up. The first passage I read was the middle verse where it was repeating this. Now I'm reading the before, middle, and end. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Digged deep. Have you ever lived in a mobile home? They have tie-down straps, and I know everybody kind of laughs about the tornadoes coming through and tearing up mobile home parks in the south. Sadly, that does happen, but it tears up big old fancy brick homes right next door just as well. But tie-downs on a mobile home are steel rods that they drive way down into the ground, and they literally tie steel cables on those things, and they pull them up over the mobile home they they run them under they secure that mobile home deep down into the soil into the earth to give it a little more protection from storms of course storms come it's not enough to do on the surface the will of god In my life, when I have faced crisis and I struggled to keep my head above water, it's because I knew I was not deep. I knew I was skating across the top of things with God. And I, it taught me to dig deeper all the time. You know, when you're in a storm or you're in a crisis, it's easy to call out to God. But if you haven't got that foundation before, it's much harder to hold on. And it, it's in the lull, it's in the time of calm that you need to be doing the deep digging, not in the middle of the storm. It's already there. You've just got to hold on. Do you agree? But in the calm, when everything's looking fine, that's when you dig. That's when you put down your roots. That's when you study and memorize scripture. That's when you commit it to memory. That's when you learn those worship songs so that when your heart is breaking,
when all the forces of evil are coming against you or someone you love, you know those scriptures. You know those worship songs. You know how to call out to God in a clean heart without fear because you've done the deep digging in the calm. And let me say, some storms last a long time. You know, we talk about tornadoes. They'll, a tornado literally can be here in an instant, and we don't know it's coming. Hurricanes aren't that way. Hurricanes come for a long time before they hit. We know. We can prepare. Hurricanes last longer, but we have more warning. Tornadoes can be over quickly, and there is very little warning. In the spirit, there are tornadoes and there are hurricanes in every life. It's vital that you lock it down before it hits. Let's look at the parable of the sower. Just a couple of verses here. Luke chapter 8, 5 and 6. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. Hey, there's a rock. Great. Rocks are steady. This is going to be good. It fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. We wash with the water of the word. I always equate the word with water. Water with the word. So this seed fell on a rocky place. It started to grow, but there was no word there to keep it growing, to sustain it. There was no root. Think about that. When God, you know, we always think, well, we need to plant seed in people's lives. We need to, God's planting seed in our life. Every day that we wake up and draw breath, he has seed to plant in our life. It doesn't matter if we've been born again for five minutes or 50 years. There is new seed that he wants to plant in our life. We need to dig down deep into the rock that he is. But on that flip side, we need our heart to not be a rock where his seed cannot grow. It, there's so many facets to the concept of the rock we need to study, and this is how my Bible studies go. When I'm, when I'm doing my, my Bible studies, I pull these things apart like tangles in, a, in Ellie's hair. Sit there and pick it apart. Pull it, pull it, pull it till you get it out. There's so much truth that's getting missed because it's hard. You know, I kind of went on a rant there for a little while about the King James Bible, and, and I get so, I, I get righteously indignant every time I, I hear someone say, well, that's just too hard to read, too hard to read. It's the Word of God. It's the Almighty Word of God. It's worth the effort. It's worth the effort for us to dig deep into the rock. It's worth the effort to dig the stony rocks out of our heart so that the seed can't get planted. We need to take a rock, go outside, get you a rock. Sit there and look at that thing. Flip it over backwards and forwards and contemplate the rock. There are deep things that are being missed because we're so busy with everything else. Get a lawn chair and go to a park. If you live in a city, 
Go sit in a park. Pick up a rock and ask the Lord to reveal all of his truth because you're going to need it. That's why I'm grieving because it's like an armory. Well, let, let me just tell you this little story. When we went to Williamsburg last year, oh, it was so wonderful. But in Williamsburg, they have the armory. And they call it something else, but I don't remember what it was. Anyway, you know, Williamsburg is the town where our country started, really. You know, the, the revolution against England. And one of the events that really brought on what would become the revolt there was arm there was arms there was uh, uh ammunition there was weapons and all in the armory and the governor would not let the militia or the locals in there they they were literally on one side of the street and there's the little the little road there you just walk across a few steps and there's this huge brick armory and the governor had his british troops around it and the the militia guys they stood there they'd been in there a hundred times they could see the armory loaded with with everything that they needed but those british troops stood around it and wouldn't let them have it and the can you imagine the frustration this was their the, the local guy stuff and i know i'm telling that super simple but that's what i see sometimes when they were telling us about that when we were there at williamsburg it just it just dropped in my spirit that this is this is this is the body of christ we have this armory filled with the weapons of our warfare with the prayer the word of god the promises our brothers and sisters the holy spirit all of this to fight the battle but we don't access it because the enemy tells us it's not important it's too hard it's not we don't have time it's not worth it just let it go just be quiet don't say anything you're going to make somebody mad get the word out sisters be soldiers in the army of the lord and and you know what I think it's called MOS. I think that's what they call it in in the military. Your job. Your job in the military. Your job, your MOS in the army of God may be for you to be on your knees beside your bed praying all the time. If that's your job, be the best of those that you can possibly be. It may be that you are the one who's supposed to make a pie every time somebody gets sick and you're supposed to take that pie. That may be the greatest weapon that you have against evil. And when you deliver that pie, you deliver a hug and a word of encouragement. You may be the sister that babysits everybody. All the kids. Mom needs a break. Bring the kids to me. Lady down the street. She may have trouble getting her garbage out to the road because it's the garbage can is heavy. It may be your MOS to make sure that woman's garbage gets carried out to the road. Or you may be the one who has to address sin openly because you have a family member or someone within your realm who is walking in perversion and thinks it's okay. You may be the voice that God sends to address the situation. But whatever your job is in the kingdom, you dig deep, you get your roots down into that rock of Jesus you equip yourself with the word 
And you do what you're called to do. It requires all of us doing what we're supposed to do. Luke 8, 13. They on the rock are they when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, for which a while believe which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. They on the rock are they, which this is Jesus' explanation of the seed that fell on the rock. They on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word of joy. And these have no root, for which, which for a while believe and in time tempta in temptation fall away. He's saying, he's explaining to his disciples what this parable is saying. People get the word of God and they're real happy about it. Yes, it's great. Oh, yes, praise the Lord. He's going to bless us. God loves you the way you are. He's going to give me blessings. And if I, if I cry and feel really bad for what I did yesterday and I say, Jesus, be Lord of my life, not that I'm going to live any different, but if I say that, then I get to go to heaven and I don't have to burn in hell. But when temptation comes, they fall away. The truth of our Christianity is not in the good times. The truth of our Christianity is in the bad times. I don't mean in the really bad times. Like, like it, it's a funny balance because sometimes, like in the really, really, really most horrible scenario, of course we're going to call out to God and we're going to just be as diligent as we can to sing and praise the Lord and ask for prayer and pray. And then in the really, really good times, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings. It's in those little irritating, little nitpicky, frustrating, dull throb of a toothache kind of times that your real Christianity comes out. How do I know that? Mirror. Mirror. When somebody cuts you off on the road, little Jesus, y'all heard me say it, stump your toe in the middle of the night, what comes out? Bump your head on something, what comes out? Little baby walks through your house, picks up an antique teacup, throws it across the room, shatters it in pieces. What comes out? The lady at the grocery store gives you an attitude. What goes through your head? Do you bless her silently? Or do you grumble? get mad your husband tracks mud in on the floor that you just spent two hours mopping your boss docks your pay because you were five minutes late that's when you decide no that's when you show your Christianity that's when we mostly fail do y'all agree y'all are being really quiet I don't know if I've upset you with all my crying now I want to talk about temptation because this scripture said and in time of temptation they fall away and that's where I'm going to move next. I looked up the word temptation an experiment attempt trial proving temptation an experiment Attempt, trial, proving. That was not what I expected the definition of temptation to be. The trial of man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, 
constancy, the enticement to sin, whether arising from the desires or from outward circumstances, the internal temptation to sin, the temptation by which the devil sought to divert Jesus, the Messiah, from his divine errand, the word divert stood out to me in that definition. Of the condition of things or a mental state by which we are enticed to sin or to lapse from the faith and holiness. To lapse from the faith and holiness. Bless you, Pramelia. Adversity, affliction, trouble. Sent by God and serving to test or prove one's character, faith, and holiness. Rebellion against God by which his power and justice are, as it were, put to the proof and challenged to show themselves. That's a long list, but all of that is on temptation. It's listed in the definitions and the strongs in the Blue Letter Bible. There's almost too much there. Temptation, the trial of man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, constancy. As a daughter of the king of the universe, I want to have fidelity, integrity, virtue, and constancy. Constancy, not changing every time something happens, not continually questioning every other day, am I on the right path, am I doing the right thing? Am I going in the right direction? When we are that way, we are useful to no one. Fidelity. Firm, holding on, faithful, honorable to our commitment. Fidelity, faithful, virtuous. There's a whole chapter in the Word that talks about the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31. How many times have we read Proverbs 31? We even have, I have a Bible study on our website that I went through years ago, verse by verse. And you know, there's people that, that have studied it and they see it this way and other people see it this way. Every time I go through that, I find something new that I did not know before. I've been crying so much, my eyes are swelling up. The one of the temptation by which the devil sought to divert Jesus, the Messiah, from his divine errand. You know, when he went out into the wilderness, we're going to read that in a minute, for 40 days. The devil sought to divert the Son of God from his holy calling. And this one, we've been doing the Lord's Prayer in, in our little Wednesday night Bible study with the children. And we just did um, lead us not into temptation. 
but deliver us from evil. Hey, Liz, it's hard to explain to a five-year-old, lead us not into temptation. Well, Granny, why would God lead us into temptation? He doesn't want us to be tempted. He loves us. God doesn't lead us into temptation. So we don't even have to ask him to not lead us into temptation. Good question. Good question. Yes, Lord. And now I get to tell you what he so graciously showed me just before we started. So y'all know we had this stray dog come up, Pearl. She's great Pyrenees. She's a sweet dog, but completely nuts. I mean, she's just very hyper. And I've been taking her to obedience classes with Olivia, and she's doing really good. But her one thing is to devour anything that's edible in an instant. Um... If I even look like I've come out the door with something in my hand, she's immediately mm -hmm. at me trying to get it out of my hand. Now, last week in our obedience class, the, the thing that Olivia was teaching is the command, leave it. And what we have to do is you have to have your leash taut on the dog, and then we walk them through a gauntlet of doggy toys and doggy treats and dog biscuits all the way through to the end. And every time the dog turns its head to look at that whatever it is that as it's walking by, you pull tight on the collar and you say, leave it. And of course, if they turn back and look up at you, they get a treat. You have to have a hand full of treats ready to give them. And they make it all the way to the end. And if they haven't jumped or lunged at something, you know, you give them treats. And then you have to turn around and you walk back. So the command is leave it. Leave it. So I've been working on Pearl with that. And when I go outside in the morning, I feed Pearl and Franklin in their own bowls. And then I feed the cats on the deck. Well, she's just, she's just, so fast, she just inhales her food. Then she'll run over to Franklin's dish. And, of course, Franklin will eat her lunch, literally. Franklin will eat her up if she starts messing with his food. But then the next thing is she will run up on the deck to the cats to eat all of their food. So that's what I've been working on, working really hard to keep her from getting their food. So using the command, leave it. And my fly swatter, because I don't normally have the leash on her just at any time. So I fly swatter knows, leave it, Pearl, leave it. And so just before Bible study today, I went out to feed, because it's been raining here, so I was a little late getting them fed. And I'm working with Pearl, leave it, Pearl, leave it, Pearl. And I was standing out there on the porch. And I popped her on her nose. And I came back inside. Came around. Came into the kitchen and looked out the kitchen door. And she was sitting beside the kitchen door. Watching the cats on the other side of the deck. Eating their food. She was not racing toward them. She was not crouched down preparing to jump. She was sitting peacefully waiting. And I immediately turned and I opened up the dog biscuit thing and I got her one out and I opened the door and I called her to me and made her sit and I gave her that dog biscuit as her reward for leaving it. And then the Holy Spirit flooded my soul. And he told me 
All I want to do is give you a blessing when you obey me. And when you do wrong, you suffer. But when you obey, I bless you. And it was like instantly I understood the point of teaching a dog to leave it. It's not so it won't eat all the cat's food. It's so that if you are somewhere with that dog and something is dropped or there's something dangerous, you can give a one-time command, leave it. And the dog will instantly turn to its master in obedience, trusting its master, and then wait for its blessing. So simple. So simple. But there are dogs, and you know, we in the class I, I'm in, there's seven or eight dogs and their owners in the class. Some dogs are just constantly side to side, side to side, looking, lunging, being pulled back, lunging, being yelled back, you know, everything. Just It's just a whirlwind of sheer panic because all of this stuff is all along the side as they walk through. And instead of just resting in their mind, and looking back up at their master, trusting that their master will bless them. They're in frantic mode. And it's like I just, standing on that porch, I just saw this entire whirlwind of fear and panic and hopelessness and anger and bitterness and frustration and pain. And the Holy Spirit just said, leave it. Just leave it. Leave it. We struggle to figure out how to figure it out, don't we? We struggle to, to figure out what's the answer, what's the answer, what do I do? How do I handle this? What am I going to say? You know, God, are you still there? God, do you see what's happening? God, 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 where are you? Leave it. And know, know beyond all doubt that you can trust your master when you've reached the last step in that gauntlet that the blessing is waiting, you're not missing out on anything of value by focusing on that blessing down there. You're not missing anything. God does not call us to war and battle in our heart all the time. You know, if we have to war against evil internally, it should be peace. It should be peace because we know that it's going to be okay. But when we war and battle and we are angry and bitter and hurting, then we're doing it in our own strength. And we're not at peace. And that's not of God. Leave it. Leave it. Leave the fear. And look up. And just know that God is covering it. He really is. Here's the thing. Either he is covering it or it truly is hopeless and the whole thing's over. If God is not bigger, is God if God is not big enough to handle all of it, 
we're wasting our time anyway. It's all pointless. It's all going to blow up in a disaster. I'm waiting. Nothing's blowing up. Nothing's blowing up. The spark of hope is so powerful. If you go back in your own life, just the times that you have seen the miracles of God. Did y'all know that I lost three babies? I was fairly convinced that I would never have a child live. Yeah. We have six children and 14 grandchildren with two more on the way. We will end this summer with 16 grandchildren and a great-grandson now. When I say that, it may sound a little prideful, and I guess I guess in some ways I do have a, a pride, but not because I did it. it. You know, you don't get to have kids if God doesn't do it. But I always remember back to that time in my life when I was laying in the hospital yet again, waiting for the doctor to come in, thinking, not going to have that family you dreamed of, Angie. That's not in the dice for you. <laughs> yes, I said in the dice. Did you know, have I mentioned to you that when I was a baby, I had rheumatoid arthritis? I did. My mother told me that I would lay on a mattress on the floor and roll back and forth and scream in pain day after day after day. And they fully expected me to be crippled all of my life. And of course, my life would have been short. But then one day, the pain lessened. And somehow, I got better. Somehow. By some miracle. I got better. God, two weeks ago, we got a message that one of the baby girls in Sarah's day uh, preschool, her mama was one of the preschool workers. Baby got strep throat, had a little trouble breathing in the night, got to the ER. Literally, within an hour or two, they put her on life support. Precious, healthy, healthy, no other problems. Two-year-old child is now on life support. Every hour, mm -hmm. one thing after another. They're going to have to amputate her legs. They're going to have to amputate her arms. And the mama says, please pray. Please pray. We found out, was it yesterday, I think, that young mother didn't know you could come off of life support and live. Think about that for a minute. She didn't know that there was a chance of life after the life support. So within hours, they put her little girl on life support in her mind. But she still called out for prayer.
there is always hope. And you always have a choice to leave the hell behind and move forward in God's grace. I feel it so strong today. We're not having a crisis in our family. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I had somebody right there. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Our Everybody is fine. Paul's mom is, is struggling right now. But, you know, we just, we've just bathed her in prayer. Um, and asking God to be with her every minute. But uh, otherwise, I mean, the children are good. The grandchildren are good. Nobody's nobody's sick. Everybody's got a good job. Nobody's been fired or laid off. And, and so right now, the weight I'm feeling is for my sisters and my brothers in the Lord. Who are struggling with peace and with hope, lack of hope. And I just, as I went through, I kept saying, Father, this Bible study, it's, it's. And he said, you tell what I said to tell. And you let me do the work. So that's what I'm doing. But if you get nothing else out of this today. Leave it. Think about my little dog. So badly wanting what looks so good over there. But when she learns that her master has something better, she can leave that stuff alone and wait for the blessing. And ladies, God has wonderful things. We're going to go through some horrible stuff in this world. We are. Because this world is consumed. But you can leave all that behind. In your mind and in your spirit. Leave it. And I wrote it down. Let me find it. I'm not going to quit until I get these two passages in. Oh, where did I put them? Two passages. Ephesians four seventeen through 24. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lascivi lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This isn't talking about like some, you know, we set sins in different places and we have these acceptable sins and these really unacceptable bad sins. Not trusting God is a bad sin. That we, it's a temptation. It's a diverting away from God's plan for your life. Isaiah chapter 1, 16 through 19. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. There's always hope. And I'm going to stop right there. Next week, I'm going to continue on in 2 Samuel. But I've got a little bit more to, to cover on this that I didn't finish today. And I love y'all. And I pray that something I've said, if there's something in you that's hurting or in fear or bitter or angry, leave it. Leave it and seek the blessing of God. And I love you very much. And I pray for y'all. And I ask you to pray for us. And I hope you have a really wonderful, victorious week ahead of you. And if and when the enemy comes, deal with him as a daughter of God. Get the word after him. You don't have to stress. You don't have to worry. Love you. Bye.